Praise God. I'm excited. If you open your Bibles with me this morning to Philemon chapter 1, we'll get there momentarily. Before we do, as you just heard, we're going to start a new series uh, this today entitled Identity. Identity. Amen. When we say identity, the meaning of that simply, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means personal identity, who someone is, the name of a person, the distinguishing character or personality of an individual. Identity simply is about who we are. Everybody says about, say this with me, who I am. Identity is about who we are. For every believer that's going to be here, this series is about the discovery of who you are in Christ. I want you to know that's pretty important. It's a discovery of who we are in Christ. And I don't, I don't care how, how much you know about who you are in Christ. I can assure you, you're going to discover some new things about who we are in Christ. For the unbeliever, this series will be a discovery of who God created them to be. Because God loves sinner and saint alike. He loves believer and unbeliever alike. He just wants the unbeliever to become a believer. And the way they become that way is through understanding what God has done for them in Christ. And how we actually grow as believers as well is understanding our identity and understanding who we have become as well because we are in Christ. Now, as you have your Bible open with me to Philemon chapter 1, we left last week at the end of our our last uh, message of our uh, last uh, series that we just did on epinosis with this verse to launch us in and be the platform of where we want to use to talk about all this time about our identity. And in Philemon 1.6 it says that the communication of thy faith may come effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Well, the, the first half of that verse is a little wordy and it kind of, as we read it, it kind of uh, draws our attention away from the attention of the last half of the verse. But let me th- explain this to us because this word communication means a sharing or a giving. In other words, there is a sharing of our faith. There's a, a giving or a communication or a fellowshipping of our faith with others that God wants us to be good at. Amen. Now notice it goes on to say that uh, that your faith may become effectual. This word fe- effectual means powerful or working. Isn't that what it's all about anyway, that our faith becomes powerful and working as believers in our life? Come on. Hey, this is an interactive sermon. You can say amen. It's all right. And so notice God says, I want the sharing of your faith to become powerful. I want it to become effectual. I want it to become effective in working. And then he tells us how. By the acknowledging of every good thing that's in us in Christ Jesus. Now, what we need to know, if you remember last time, that this word acknowledging is a a special Greek word. It's the word epinosis, which means knowledge or the true knowledge of God. So what we can say like this, the sharing of of our faith becomes becomes powerful, becomes working by the knowledge or by the understanding, here it is, of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Notice it talks about every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. This is talking about our identity, who we become when we get in Christ, who we become when we get saved. Not just what we get, but actually who we become. Because for too long, Christians have just believed they get something. Yes, they do get eternal life. Yes, they do get salvation. But it's more than just receiving something. You actually receive someone and get something, a brand new life, a brand new identity in Christ. And notice it comes, this is where, notice it says here that every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus, notice there's no bad things in you in Christ. Isn't that good news? 
There's a lot of bad things outside of Christ and things you were before you were Christ or things that are in that flesh or, or in an unregenerate soul. But there are no bad things in Christ. There's only good things. And the Scripture says through our knowledge and knowledge of this, and knowledge and an understanding of every good thing in us in Christ makes that faith become powerful and working in order to share with others the right way. In other words, to be effective in sharing with others our faith. How many know that would be important? As believers, we need this knowledge for our faith to work right and for our witness to be powerful. And once again, isn't that really what all this is about? All of us want our faith working right, and all of us should be wanting to be a powerful witness for Christ. Amen. Praise God. So this is really what our identity is about. Amen. Have, for, for example, in Ephesians chapter 2, in, cha- in verse 10, in the New Living Translation, did you know that in Christ that God has made you and I a masterpiece? This is what the scripture says, for we, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Notice once again, it's talking about this phrase being in Christ. Amen. It's connected with our salvation. But more importantly, or as importantly, it's connected to a brand new identity making us who God created us to be and an identical relationship or likeness to Christ Jesus and so that we can once again do the good things that God has planned for us Long ago. You know, some of these good things, nobody even has a clue that God got good things for us. This is why this is so important, that you realize that God only has good plan for us. Any bad that we experience is not coming from the will of God. I said the bad that we experience is not coming from the will of God. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes, talking about Satan, only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have life more abundantly. So, so I want to talk about it really briefly. There are, there are some reasons why this series on identity is so important to all of us. Because finding out who we are, what we have, and what we can do because we're in Christ is vital for our faith. For order for us to live right before God and to be powerful in our life towards others, we have to have an understanding of who we are, what we have, and what we can do because we're in Christ. Or you can say this, because we have a a brand new identity in Christ. And what we're going to do is find out about it. These are What I'm talking about is some reasons why this series would be so important. Here's another reason why this series is so important, to keep us from having an identity crisis. I'm saying this, this is why this series is so important. It will keep us from having an identity crisis. An identity crisis is defined as a psychological conditional state, a feeling of unhappiness and confusion caused by not being sure about who we really are, or you really are, or what the true purpose of life is. And I can tell you, there's a lot of people in identity crisis. This series is going to train wreck identity crisis in our lives. Amen. It's going to make us understand that who we are and what we have and what we can do because we have an identity. It's in Christ. Why is this series on identity so important? Because it's going to keep us from experiencing or possibly experiencing identity theft. Now, I'm not talking about now, all of us have heard of identity theft. Amen. Someone stealing your, your, your private information in order to, to, to make a, a lucrative transaction for themselves. You could say it like that. But the identity theft that I'm talking about is Satan actually stealing the true knowledge of who you really are or who God created you to be. What if Satan is stealing you blind and you don't even know it? 
And, and what if, and this, this series is important because what if uh, you find out that, you're not only, that you not only have a natural identity, but you have a spiritual one as well? I'm going to say that again. This series is important because most people are trapped in a natural identity. What if you find out, and you will if you stick around, that you have more than a natural identity, you have a spiritual one as well. Unfortunately, because people do not know about the identity that God created them to have in Christ, many people live and die and never really find their true identity, which is a spiritual one. Amen. Praise God. Turn with me to Proverbs 29, verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18. You're listening real good this morning. I believe in God to give you eyes to see and ears to hear. I believe in God to do in you and in us what only He can do today. How about you? In Proverbs 29, verse 18, I'm going to read from the Amplified Translation and read the first half of this verse. It says, where there is no vision or redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. Notice it calls vision a redemptive revelation of God. Of God. It says if we don't have a redemptive revelation of God, we will perish. Well, this identity series is about redemptive revelation. I'm going to say it again. This series on identity is important because it's about redemptive revelation. It's about what God, when I say redemptive revelation, it has everything to do with what God did for man in or through or because of Jesus Christ and us finding out about what God did through Christ for us. That's what redemptive revelation is. It's understanding what God did for man through Christ and how that affects our life personally. That's what redemptive revelation is about. Amen. And, and so this is what we're going to be talking about in our identity series. All these things. But today I want to do something a little differently, but it's going to be necessary. How many know that we have some builders out here? I look through the audience and I see some builders out here. You know, if you're building a house, the first thing you don't do is build the roof. The first thing you do is do the foundation. Isn't that right? And then it goes up. Well, it's very similar in teaching on topics. We need to talk about foundational things. And so today, and talking about, in beginning, and talking about our identity. I'm going to do something a little differently, but necessary for the foundation of our understanding about who God made us. And what we're going to do today, this message is going to be entitled, Who is God? Who is God? Because, see, what you're going to find, and you and I find, that we must know who God is before we can find out who we are. Amen. And so uh, today, in just a few moments, we're going to, you know, people have all kinds of questions about God, and rightfully so. So what we're going to do is we're going to answer a few questions about God. Now, I realize I, in one sense I'm preaching to the choir. What do you mean I'm preaching to the choir? Well, I mean this, that the things I'm getting ready to talk about, uh, a, a pastor could take for granted that every person in here already knows and believes what I'm getting ready to talk about, about God. Who is God? Or questions people have about God. They don't have those questions about God because they're answered already. But I submit to you, I'm wise enough to know there's, there's plenty of believers that, that do not know the answer to these questions. Or if they do, they can't explain them to other people. And so therefore, it would be ne necessity for us to talk about some of the questions that people will have about God. Because even if you don't have that question about God, by understanding the answer will help you better prepare to minister to people that do have those questions. And having to know that would be important. And so here's some questions that people have about God. Is there really a God? If you believe the Bible, then where did God come from? Who made God? All those are legitimate questions. 
And yet there are questions that all of us as believers should know the answer to, but many times we may not know the answer where to. See, what you have to understand is faith is never blind. Bible faith is never blind. It's always based upon evidence. Evidence found in God's Word. Because you cannot have faith in God apart from God's Word. Amen. And so it's important that we understand this uh, truth. And so, th- is there a God? Yes, there is. He's clearly revealed himself according to the scripture. Here's a good, here's a good scripture for us to, to think about in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. I'm not sure I asked them to put that up, but we'll turn there. I'll read this. For the, God said, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that man is without excuse. In other words, because there is creation, God says, I give evidence of my divinity and who I am through creation so that all mankind is without excuse. This is what God says. So here's a question that people have. Then where did God come from and who made God? Well, God reveals himself many times in the scripture as the self-sufficient one. Amen. Or the all, the, he, he, let me say it like this. He's the all-sufficient one or the self-existing one. And so we have ex- examples of that in many places in the Word of God. Let's look at a couple. In Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 11, here's what it says. It says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I might have chosen. That you may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me. There was no God form, neither shall there be any after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. In Isaiah 44, verse 6 through 8, it says this. It says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I imported the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have I not told you uh, thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me, he asks? Yea, no, there is no God. No, I know not any other. Amen. So God is saying that he is the self-existing one. Matter of fact, God says, you can write this down in Isaiah 46, verse chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. God says, this is how you're going to know I'm God. I'm going to tell you the end from the beginning. That's how you're going to know I'm God. And this book that we have right here is a prophetic book. It tells us not only the past, the present, but it tells us the future with 100% accuracy. So this is how God says, you're going to know I'm God. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a book, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to speak it. It's going to be recorded, and I'm going to show you the, the future before it ever happens. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it ever comes to pass. That's how you're going to know that I'm God. So these, all these questions that people have, they're answered from the Word of God. doesn't mean that, that people are bad because all of us have had those questions. Because we have, listen, we have an enemy of our soul called Satan who sits on our shoulder and, and, and speaks into our mind and, and tries to cloud our, our reason. When in truth is, you cannot know God solely with your mind. You know God with your spirit. We need our mind because our mind is a doorway to our spirit. But we actually know God with our hearts. Amen. And God will deal with us in our hearts or in our spirits because we are eternal spirits made in his likeness and image. How many know that John chapter 4 verse 24 says that God is a spirit? And they that worship him must worship him in his spirit and truth. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says, I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when God created and made man, he made us in his likeness and image. And because God is a spirit, an eternal spirit being, we are eternal spirit beings. And that's how we communicate with God, spirit to spirit. 
Spirit to spirit. God is not a mind. He has a mind, but he's not a mind. He's a spirit. And he communicates with us spirit to spirit. Amen. All of these things that people have questions about can be answered uh, from the Word of God. Now, today we're talking about who is God. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, you'll find an interesting portion of Scripture that is relevant for us today as it was then. And in verse 13, it says, And when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Jesus came to his disciples and said, Hey, who do people say that I am? His disciples begin to answer in verse 14. It says, and and they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah the prophet, uh, Elijah or the others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, and here's the same thing he's still asking today. But whom say you that I am? See, he asked them, who do people say I am? And then that after he, they answered that, then he asked them the all-important question that he still answer, ask us today, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood, in other words, man did, have not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Amen. So what we're seeing here is that knowing, in other words, what we see here is that Peter answered Jesus right. He answered the question right when he said, but who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, making him, co- making him equal with God and God manifested in the flesh. They knew that the son of God, the Messiah, would be God manifested in the flesh. And the Christian faith, we know that God is comprised of three persons, one, one in three. God the Father, God the Son, God the, the Holy Spirit. All three co-equal and co-eternal God. One God and three divine persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Son stepped out of eternity and became a man for the purpose of redeeming man back unto God. Since man sinned and got us into this mess, a man was going to have to come and through living right and doing right was going to have to redeem man back to God. But he was going to have to pay the price that man had to pay for his sin and that was death. So God himself had to die on behalf of man so that man could be right with God. But the question is, who do you say that I am? And he said, he answered it right there, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So knowing this, knowing who God is, is part of the redemptive revelation to man. See, notice he said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. See, you didn't understand this with your mind, Peter. You didn't understand this because someone else told you. You understood this because my Father, the Father in heaven, has revealed this to you. It's called redemptive revelation. And who, knowing who God is is part of God's redemptive revelation to man so that we can know who God is too. If we were designed to, listen, if we were designed to get at true identity from and through Christ, and we are, we too butter know who he is. If we're, in other words, this is why we're talking about who God is. Because if we were to get our identity through him, we butter know who he is. And so in other words, we must put first things first. We must answer the question like Jesus asked Peter and his disciples, but who do you say that I am? First things first is who is God? Who is Christ? See, because if you're confused about God, you won't get an accurate picture of yourself. We really can't know who we are without knowing who God is. Oh, I'm going to say that again. You can't really know who you are without knowing who God is. Our knowledge of God is key to finding out who, you, who we are. See, when I said we can't really know who we are without knowing who God is, everybody, a lot of times people say, well, that can't be true. I know who I am. No, you can never know who God made you to be apart knowing him because the life and the plan that God has for man is tied up in him. And we really cannot know who we are without knowing who God is. Our knowledge of God is key to finding out who we are. Without knowing God, 
we really won't know ourselves. And we certainly will not know life's purposes or our life's purpose. We won't know it. We'll do our own thing. We'll do something. But we won't know our life's purpose. So who is God? So who is God? So remember, understanding this is key to understanding who we are. See, some of you are sitting here today and you're you're just thinking, well, everybody should know who God is. But everybody doesn't know who God is. And the truth is, the people that you're going to come in contact today and tomorrow and your workplaces and the places that you go, even your family members don't know who God is. They know there's a God, but they don't know who God is. Some say he's this, some say he's that, some same thing that his disciples said. But who do you say that he is? See, and until you can say he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you, haven't, you don't have redemptive revelation that God wants you to have. See, the redemptive revelation that God wants us to have is is an understanding of what God did for all mankind through Christ and through our identity with Him makes us a brand new person. Amen. So, who is God? Turn with me to Genesis 1-1. Genesis 1-1, it says, In the beginning, God created the the, the heaven and the earth. Notice that. In the beginning. So God first reveals himself as creator. He first reveals himself as creator. The divine creator who made man in all of creation. Now listen to what I'm getting ready to say. When the Bible says in the beginning God created it, it is saying there is a divine, infinite, intelligent designer and creator that made everything including you and I. The reason this is so important is because it means that that if there is creation, there is a creator. And there is a divine creator who made man. And we, if that's true, then we must be accountable to him and he makes the rules to live by. Listen, listen to what I'm getting ready to say. The reason the evolutionists fight creation as revealed in the Bible is because creation means there is a creator, God. That's why they fight that. Once you say there is no God, you can say man is just part of some evolutionary process. Have you got it figured out? Evolutionists believed in materialism. In other words, that matter is all there is. In other words, materialism is, by definition, is the philosophical theory, notice theory. The philosophical theory that matter is the only reality. They believe everything comes out of matter. Matter somehow created us and it denies a spiritual, all spiritual realities. So man is just part of some random process called evolution. Listen, what we need to understand is evolution. It, listen, you say, well, Pastor Chris, I don't believe in evolution. But, but listen, we need to talk about it because you need to know how to defend your faith. You need to know what the Bible says because there's plenty of smooth talkers out there. And there's pl- plenty of people without, without d- digging deeper in the Bible. See, p- what, what, I'm, what I'm saying again is our faith is not blind. Our faith is based upon clear evidence of, what, of who God is, what God has done. And it's based not just upon it is, and it confirms science, but it also confirms and is proven by history. So all these things are based upon facts and evidence. Amen. And so, what we have to understand is evolution is a way of thinking that man decides the truth and what truth is. That's what it really is. I'm going to say it again. Evolution is a way of thinking. That man decides truth and what truth is. Because after all, if there is no God, you are accountable to no one and you can set your own rules. If there is no God, man has the right to do whatever he wants to do, and that's why people want to believe in in, in evolution and not the Bible, and in the beginning God created. That's That's why they want to believe there's no God. Evolution's foundation is man decides truth with man's changing philosophies and opinions. I'm going to say that again. Evolution's foundation 
is man decides what truth is. And can you imagine how dangerous that is? With all his changing philosophies and, and opinions. Where Christianity's foundation is God decides the truth as revealed in God's unchanging world, word with moral absolutes that we're to live by and to answer to him by. This is why Romans 1.20, amen, that we just read about God proves that he's God by the creation that he created. That everybody's without excuse. It says in Romans chapter tw- uh, 1 verse 20 and in Second Peter chapter 3 verses 3 through 5 that people don't believe there is a God even when God has made himself real to them because they don't want to believe because if they believe they'll have to be accountable to him. They'll have to say their way is wrong and their way of doing things must be submitted to one who is over them. If they say, if there is a God and a creator, then you must submit to the one that has created all things because he sets the rules and not us. We we got here, by the way, we we did get here by just happenstance. All this just didn't show up through a bang, through explosion, or through an evolution process. So who is God? The Bible tells us that God is a divine, infinite, intelligent designer and creator who made man in all creation. Behind everything that's created, we we must clearly see, there is a creator who has a designer and a creator. No, listen, no one walked in this building today believing that this building just happened or evolved into what it is today. No one does. Do they? No, 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 one, no one walked in and said, wow, this, uh, isn't this amazing? This just showed up one day. This just evolved. The matter just all came together and, ooh, it looked oh, pretty awesome. It just happened. No. I remember clearly sitting down with a designer, an architect, amen, builder, a creator, amen. It didn't just happen. I said it didn't just happen. And I want us to understand that this, listen, this universe and you and I are way more complicated and complex and we didn't just happen either. Nor did we evolve. Listen, you want to, listen, does everybody listen to me right now? You want to know what the greatest, the greatest proponent of racism is? Which is a problem in this country and around the world. You want to know the greatest proponent of racism is? Someone said it right in the back, evolution. Evolution is the greatest proponent of racism. Because it sets certain people apart from others. And, and clearly says in their belief that, that some are way lower than others and, and, and some of us have evolved into higher and some of us are, are still lower and all those kind of crazy things. And yet, in our streets today, there's fights over racism, but racism is not going to go away as long as our universities and its professors and its proponents of, of Marxism, communism, socialism, and evolution are standing in, in behind things and feeding the next generation lies that say that there is no God. Somebody could say amen, put your hands together and clap and jump and run. But it's true anyway. No, God created it. So let's do this. Let's take it one step further. Who is God? Now, I hit the, I hit the, tar, the, the hard part. God, first of all, reveals himself as a creator. And until we get that right, we all messed up. Because we cannot believe a God if we don't believe there is a creator behind creation. Once again, that's why the, the theory of evolution fights the, in the beginning God because uh, it fights creation because creation declares there's a God. It just didn't happen. It happened because God said and God saw. God said and God saw. God said and God saw. So let's take it a next, a, 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 next, a, a next step since you got that God is creator. 
Amen. I believe you all got that. But, but, but listen to this. Who is God? Well, God is love. Write these down. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and 16 tells or reveals this, that God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16 both say that God is love. Romans 5, 8 said God demonstrates his own love towards us. That even while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world. God is love. God so loved the world. That includes you and I. God so loved the world. The world before we even knew Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoso will believe on him will not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. Oh, that's good news. God is love. I said God is love. Matter of fact, Romans chapter 5, verse 6, one translation says that Christ came and died for those who could care less about a loving God. So what does this mean? This means that God is in love with us and not mad at us. What am I saying? God is in love. God is love and God is in love with us, not mad at us. Woo! This means even, listen to what I'm getting ready to say. This means even if we've done or said terrible things against God. Said there is no God. I hate God. I curse God. I did all those kinds. I sinned against God. I was a whoremonger. I was a, a thief. I, I did all those things. Even, this is what it means. God loves us. He's not mad at us. Listen to what I'm getting ready to say. This means even if we've done or said terrible things against God, God will forgive us if we would just repent and turn to Jesus and trust him to save us. That's good news. That is the love of God. That sure ain't your love. Now, it might be if you got Christ and you got that love in you, it can be. But that ain't human love. This is why 1 John chapter 3 said, what manner, behold, what manner, what kind of foreign, exotic kind of love that God has for us, that he would send his son to die for us. You see, love sees things that we can't see about ourselves. I'm going to say it again. Love sees things that we can't see about ourselves. Love, by definition, you can say it like this, is expressed by and is awakened by a sense. Love is awakened. God's love is awakened in him by a sense of preciousness and valuableness of the object that it loves that causes him to prize it. Do you want me to say that again? God's love, this agape love, this love that God has for mankind is awakened within him by a sense of preciousness and valuableness of the object he loves that causes one, him, to prize it. This is why in Matthew chapter 13, you, 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 call the, the, you call the treasure hid in the field. You call the pearl of great price. This is why in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, Jesus, through verse 46, Jesus explained it like this. He that had ears to hear, let him hear, the previous verse says. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. That which when a man hath found, he hideth and but joy goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth the field. And again, that's talking about Jesus. That's talking about Jesus leaving his place in heaven, seeing us on earth and coming and buying us. The treasure hid in the world in a field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. I'm here to tell you today that not only you are the treasure hid in the field, but you are the pearl of great price. And get over it, the person next to you. And down the street is the same way. That's how God feels about them too. That's that love that we sang about today. That's that love that God is. He don't just have it, he is it. This love is, is self-sacrificial to the benefit of the one love. In other words, love is always benefiting the one it loves. That's why Jesus Christ, God himself, came 
and died and paid the price for our sins and our redemption. He's just waiting for us to repent. He's just waiting for us to believe on Christ. God is love and in love with us and wants us to know the truth about him. And when we know the truth about him, here's what it'll do. It'll draw us close to him and we'll want him. The reason why more people don't want God is because they haven't heard the truth about God. They see God as a big ogre in heaven getting ready to swash them for all their sins. They think God is the one who's trying to take away all their fun, try to steal, and all these other kind of things. And, and by the way, I don't want to submit to someone like that, like that because they don't love me anyway. When the Bible says that Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy, God has come to give us life and life more abundantly. Can you see what Satan has done, tried to do and take identity theft? Where he's trying to, to cause us to not know who we are, what God has done. When we know the truth, it will draw us to him. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says it talks about the goodness of God. And it talks about it is the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. Amen. His goodness leads us to repentance. There, There has to be repentance first. Because without repentance, there's no turning from what kills us. It's called sin. Sin kills us. Make no mistake. Sin, the Bible says, there's pleasure in sin for a season. But the devil is working is for a season to run out in the middle of it and take us to hell with him. But this is why repentance is necessary and, and we must understand this part of it. Because without that, we won't know that we're in sin. We won't know what sin does, and we won't know that uh, we, what our condition is. In order to get saved, we got to get lost first. God says, i got to show you how wretched you really are without me. You think you're fine. You think you're dandy. You've made a living. You've done this. But hey, do you got a life? There is a day when we will draw our last breath. What does it profit of a man? He gained the whole world and let yet lose his soul. you got to hear the bad news before you hear the good news. But in other words, in other, you know, we should hear the good news first, but there is some bad news. And the good news is it gets better. What I'm saying is, and may, maybe we better look at the scripture. Here concerning repentance, notice what Jeremiah 17 says. Jeremiah 17 says this, verses 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is talking about man. I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. Well, if our ways are evil and wrong, how many know the fruit of it is going to be evil and wrong? In other words, what we're going to be wrought with is not good. God is awakening us to our true condition. Our condition is lost and undone. We've sinned just like Adam sinned. When Adam sinned, the whole human race fell into captivity to sin and to Satan. But God did something into Christ so that that could change, so that we could get a brand new life. We could be saved and get a brand new identity. That's what the scripture says. Because in Romans 3.23 it says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, some people say, well, you're bad, but I'm pretty good. You know, I'm going to get, you know, I'm a good, I'm a pretty good person. You know, kind of like me, you've heard my testimony. I grew up in church and thought because I, for 24 years of my life I grew up in church and thought because I did good things and didn't get caught doing bad things. Thought because I shook the preacher's hand and was water baptized as a child. Thought because I prayed every night and asked God to forgive me that I was right with God. By the way, I'm a pretty good old boy. By the way, I've never gone to jail. I've I've never killed anyone. But the Bible said, see, I'm basing me to get to heaven on my own merits and my own works. That's not how you get there. That's how you end up in hell. That's not how you get to heaven. That's how you get to hell, depending upon your own merits and your own works. Because the Bible says in in Romans 3.23 that we had all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when we see that we are a sinner, God reveals that to show two things. Number one, that we are in sin. Number two, he shows us his goodness that we have need of him. And number three, he shows us the way to him, his son Jesus Christ. He shows us the way out. 
So in other words, God is good. His goodness leads us to repentance. We turn from our sin, and it leads us to salvation. And as salvation is founded in him, we turn to him. We come to him. We come to Christ. All of this to get us saved. All of us, all of this to get us in Christ and us becoming the new person and you and I getting a brand new identity. Come on, Brother Ryan. In John chapter 17, verse 3, the New Living Translation says this. Jesus said in his prayer, his great priestly prayer to God the Father, he said, and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to the earth. So he said eternal life is in knowing God, the only true God, and your son Jesus in whom you sent. So how, do I, so how do I turn from my sin? We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Repentance is a turning from, but it's a, a turning to God. It's a turning from our way and a turning to God's way. And having to know that God's way is clear is Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. This is why the scripture says in John chapter 1 verse 12, I'm almost finished, listen carefully. John chapter 1 verse 12, as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the power to become the sons and children of God. So we can go from a life of vile, hate, and disgust, and sin against God, to a life of being forgiven, and receiving the gift of eternal life, receiving Christ and a brand new identity. All through repentance and turning to Christ in faith. There's no sin bigger than God's mercy and grace. God loves you. He's not only your creator. He is also love. And love was demonstrated by Christ going to the cross, dying for us, descending and going to hell for you and I, the place that you and I deserved. And when the claims of justice were satisfied, satisfied by Almighty God, by the Holy Spirit, Christ rose again from the dead in the power over death, hell, and the grave and had the keys of death, hell. And then he invites us this simple way in Romans 10, 13, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, whosoever shall invite Christ to be their Lord. Repent of the sins, invite Christ to be the Lord, shall be or shall become a child of God, shall be saved. Shall be saved. So who is God? Remember, Peter answered correctly. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And rem rem remember the reason finding out who God is is so important? is because in finding out who God is, You'll find out who you really are and who God made you to be, a brand new identity. But what about you in here today? What about your life? Are you identified with Christ? Do you have a new life? Do you know that you've been forgiven? Do you know that God has done today? You should know that God has done everything He's ever going to do. To give you a relationship with, with himself through Jesus Christ. He sent his son. He died on the cross. He went to hell on our behalf, rose again from the dead. He walked this earth for 33 years and, and proved that he loved by, by healing, forgiving, raising the dead, casting out devils, blessing humanity. He did all those things to show who and what God was really like. Then he died in our place on our behalf so that through our repentance and our faith in Christ, we could have a way with God and be right with God. That's a true story. And that's a story that I've been living for the last 34 years of my life. How many have been living it along with me? I see those hands in here today. But see, here what's, here's what's important. 
that not only that we know this and we keep living it, we're also here today for those that might not have ever had that chance or that opportunity or may have rejected it many times. May have turned their nose up at God. May have done all different kind of things. But today is a brand new day. And I'm telling you, if you will just repent and turn to Christ, God will forgive you. And you can too can have eternal life. He will save from the guttermost to the uttermost. He loves and He cares for you. Bow your heart and head with me and close it today. Father.